Hello, everyone. My name is Taya Montaigne. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and I'm working with Dr. Robert Stevenson. My work focuses on the uh, sphingidae ecology, including research into which species can survive in urban areas. Tonight, I will be speaking about sphingidae. I'll give some background on what they are, and then we will discuss how they survive in urban areas, how to measure diversity, and how they're impacted by human development. Before I even start to talk about the organisms I'm focusing on, I wanted to touch a bit on the topic of natural history. Natural history is the study of plants and animals while focusing on observations rather than experiments. This is things like documenting all the life stages of an insect or documenting the behavior of another animal. Natural history is an extremely important science. Unfortunately, it is a dying science. Natural history studies are severely underfunded and often get no attention from NSF or other large grant giving organizations. The preference is always given to novel research. This is problematic as there is a lot of natural history information left to learn. There is a lot of problems with this line of thinking. More importantly, natural history information is the basis for all ecology and biology. The model organisms we use are all because of natural history information that allow them to function in their specific role. A great example of this is Manduca sexta, the tobacco hornworm. This is a sphingidae that we know a lot about, including their entire life history. They're also easy to breed and rear, making them prime candidates for a number of studies. My work involves a fairly well-studied group of organisms, but there is still a lot left to learn. Every year I am out in the field collecting and gathering data, I am also observing behaviors, host plant preferences, and more. All of this data is important life history information that gets consolidated on my website, Sphingidae USA. Now, let's move on to what I'm studying. Before we can talk about my work specifically, let's define our study organisms. Commonly, Sphingidae are called hawk moths or sphinx moths. The common name of hawk moth comes from their ability to fly strongly and for long distances. The common name of sphinx moth comes from the resting position of many of their caterpillars, which sit similarly to an Egyptian sphinx. There are approximately 1,200 species of sphingidae in the world, found on every continent except Antarctica, and more are being discovered daily. Many sphingidae are important in pollinators, some being the sole pollinators of certain plants, especially orchids. Their larvae are, uh, usually have a caudal horn, which is located at the rear of the larva. Not all species have this, and some will lose it as they grow. Before we discuss the biology of these organisms, it's important to understand the life cycle. Pictured here is the complete life cycle, from ovum to adult, of Eumorpha fasciatus, the banded sphinx. The eggs are laid singly and are green. They are fairly large for Lepidoptera eggs. The larva hatches and goes through five different instars or molts. This is how it grows. For many species, they are able to change color pat or pattern through these molts. Once the larva is full grown, it digs itself underground to pupate. Most species of sphingidae pupate underground, though a few pupate in a loosely spun silken cocoon and a few others pupate in leaf litter. After sufficient time has passed, anywhere between two weeks and eight months, the adult moth emerges from the pupa. Sphingidae larvae are really, really cool and primarily what I study. These caterpillars are often called hornworms, though many species lack a caudal horn or lose it during development. To make matters more confusing, these horns are able to break off if attacked by a predator. Sphingidae larvae are easily determined by their large size, presence of a caudal horn or a fake eye spot at the end of the larva, and by their distinctive resting position. Many species are phenotypically variable, being able to change their coloration or pattern between molts based upon different environmental or genetic factors. This is especially evident in the Eumorpha species, as some of their larvae can have up to eight different color morphs. All sphingidae are herbivorous, eating the leaves of plants. This is an important distinction to make as there are indeed carnivorous Lepidoptera caterpillars. P. 
Pupa, chrysalis, and cocoon are all different words for the pupal stage of Lepidoptera. More specifically, a chrysalis is a term for butterfly pupae, though pupa is also correct. A cocoon, on the other hand, is specific to many species of moth and is a silken cover that surrounds the pupa. These distinctions may seem strange, but they're important. For example, many of our Saturniidae, or giant silk moths, pupate within a cocoon. This adds an extra layer of insulation for the pupa, as these moths tend to pupate above ground, usually in trees or leaf litter. For species that burrow underground to pupate, it is usually a bare pupa with no covering. Massachusetts is home to about 49 species of sphingidae. This includes 37 resident species, which means they regularly breed in the state and do not die back each year. Several species have not been seen in decades, and it is likely that they are extirpated in the state. Pictured here are seven of the 37 species found in Massachusetts. These primarily uh, represent nocturnal sphingidae, except Amphion floridensis, or the Nessus sphinx, which is this moth right here, uh, which can also be seen during the day. Massachusetts does have other species of diurnal sphingidae as well. Here are another 10 species of sphingidae found in Massachusetts. Larval sphingidae are much harder to identify than adults. In order to combat this, I have been doing large amounts of rearing work to document all the individual instars of every sphingidae found in the USA. This work is available for free on my website, sphingidae.us. I'm not using it. Currently, I'm working on several different projects. The one I planned on talking to you about today is entitled Sphingidae in Urban Areas. This project aims to understand and quantify the diversity and abundance of sphingidae along an urban to rural gradient. To do this, a five year long field study has been proposed and undertaken. Three years of field collection have been completed with two more years planned. To fully answer the question I've put out, we also have to examine an urban to rural gradient and what that means. For this study, we consider urban areas to be cities, whereas rural areas are much more forested, but not necessarily devoid of human impact. In Massachusetts, a, prettier, a pretty linear gradient of urban to rural is seen from east to west, as evidenced on this map. Okay, uh, um, there was a request for you to use a pointer when you can. Absolutely. Let me change that now. Um, insects and insect pollinators are facing worldwide declines in biomass and diversity. One study from Germany found there was over 75% decline in flying insect biomass over the course of 27 years. Another study from 2007 reviewed what we know about pollinator decline and the results are alarming. Many species are in decline and the effects may be catastrophic. This study focused primarily on Hymenoptera, but concluded that a decline in pollinators would be detrimental to ecosystem health, crop production, and would have numerous downstream effects on the environment. In the Northeastern US, a study was conducted that shows that over the past hundred years or so, many species of sphingidae have been declining. This study points to several factors, including urbanization and the introduction of non-native parasitoids. Urbanization and human impact undoubtedly affect insect populations by destroying or altering habitat, creating barriers like roads and buildings, or by increasing ambient light levels at night or artificial light at night, otherwise known as allen. Allen in particular affects nocturnal insects as it can disrupt mating, increase predation risk, and alter behavior like feeding. Most studies to date have focused on the decline of diurnal pollinators. This only looks at half the problem, however. Many plants are nocturnally pollinated and understanding how urbanization affects these systems is crucial. By focusing on nocturnal pollinators in my study, I aim to fill this gap in our understanding of the relationship between human activity and insect decline. This is a map of the sites I have surveyed for this project. Of these, 10 were continued past 2019. Study sites consist of DCR parks and forests, conservation lands, military bases, and private property. 
Sites are spaced out across the state and attempt to capture the linear urban to rural gradient. Sites are checked once every 14 days or so. This is done to prevent oversampling and to get multiple time points across the season so the sites can be surveyed completely. Additionally, spindity life cycles are quite long, so sampling every 14 days is sufficient to capture multiple time points within a single life cycle. Redundancy is built in by looking for both adults and larvae at each site during each visit. To survey adult sphingidae, a combination of light traps are used. A total of three setups are deployed at each site spaced far enough apart the traps are not visible to one another. The lights used are mercury vapor, metal halide, and ultraviolet. To survey for larval sphingidae, ultraviolet flashlights are used. Most species of larvae fluoresce under this light, making them easy to spot. For larvae that are brown or otherwise do not fluoresce, a standard flashlight is also used. Larvae are most active at night, which is when these surveys take place. I now have a very short video just showing how these larvae fluoresce under ultraviolet light. Organisms are collected to prevent recounting and are reared to adulthood to confirm identity if they are larvae. Adult specimens are retained in my personal insect collection. Both adults and larvae are photographed and larvae are photographed throughout their life cycle to give accurate life history information. Diversity and abundance data are collected. As I mentioned earlier, part of the work I have done has been to understand sphingidae larvae. This is important as for this survey, I am looking for both adults and larvae of sphingidae. This is a fairly novel tactic as most studies simply survey for adults. By surveying for both adults and larvae, I get much higher resolution on diversity measurements. I am able to find species that may fly early in the season before I start surveying or species that are diurnal and would not come to the lights. Additionally, this data gives me information on timing of broods and host plant preferences. Because I wanted to look at biodiversity along an urban to rural gradient, I needed to define that gradient. To begin analysis, proxies for human disturbance were found. Impervious land surface area, such as pavement, buildings, and other structures, a study from NASA, was utilized as a physical manifestation of human disturbance. The left figure shows the impervious surface area map. This was smoothed over a 30 mile radius to prevent parks from showing up a zero impervious surface area. The smoothing also makes it more accurate to show which parks are surrounded by the most impervious surface areas and therefore likely the most urban. I also looked at night sky brightness, a study from NOAA, which is used as a proxy for Allen, which directly affects the behavior and reproductive abilities of nocturnal insects. In both figures, the gradient of urban to rural can be seen from east to west on the map. Both of these descriptors are metrics of human activity, and I wanted to see whether these two were similar. If they were significantly different, additional research into metrics may be needed. This regression on the right shows that these two factors are correlated, and we can infer that night sky brightness is a reasonable predictor of human impact on surface cover and vice versa. Once my survey data was complete, I began biodiversity analysis. Use of the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index was utilized as this was what I was most familiar with from the literature and my work. After SWDI values were generated, effective number of species calculations could be completed. This graph here represents effective number of species values at each of the surveyed field sites. This graph is a correlation between light pollution, a proxy of artificial light at night and human disturbance, and the effective number of species at each site. In this case, the uh, descriptor, of, this is a descriptor of biodiversity. In this case, the biodiversity measured at each site over the last three years of my survey. Overall, the data trend toward increased biodiversity in areas with less artificial light. There are some outliers to this trend, which are circled. 
Generally, effective number of species decreases with higher human impact, in this case, light pollution. While these analyses were mostly predictive, there were some areas that fell apart. To better understand these areas, another metric was utilized, habitat diversity. This map is from the USGS and gives habitat level maps of regions. A comparison of two areas was completed to determine why differences in ENS were so high when the two rasters for human impact showed very little difference. In the left figure, you can see the site Sibley Farm in Worcester County, Massachusetts. And on the right is Joint Base Cape Cod in Barnstable County, Massachusetts. Sibley Farm has a higher ENS value, despite both sites coming out about equal for a level of human disturbance. The major difference is habitat variability. Sibley Farm has many more habitat types than Joint Base Cape Cod does, which inherently means there will be more diversity of host plant, and as such, a higher diversity of insect herbivores feeding on them. Using these methods together may clarify the correlation between effective number of species and human disturbance. This is even more evident when you realize that the yellows and dark purples are pavement or houses. The land at the Joint Base in Cape Cod is extremely fragmented due to it being an active military base. Insect collecting is a contentious topic. Among entomologists, it is very clear cut and straightforward. Collecting is necessary to study insects. There are dozens of species of Lepidoptera that can only be told apart by examining either genital morphology or other parts of morphology that would be almost impossible to examine on a living organism. This is just for Lepidoptera. For other groups, hundreds of species need to be dissected or sequenced for identity. Entomologists usually target specific individuals to take. This can vary from survey to survey as some are general biomass studies. For my study, I only collect Spingidae. This means that out of the hundreds of species of Lepidoptera I see each night I am out, I am only taking about 10 to 15 individuals a night. In comparison, when you drive a car at night, you kill many more insects than that. Large lights around stores, houses, or park headquarters also draw in hundreds of insects that end up dying due to predation from getting stuck at artificial light. If you want to help insect populations, turn off external lights at night unless you are specifically trying to attract and record nocturnal insects. This has a much greater effect on populations than limiting collection will ever do. While it is very easy to have an emotional response to the killing of insects, know that when done properly, there is no effect on the ecosystem. To illustrate this, a 2018 paper did a meta-analysis on collections of small mammals and found no decrease in populations over time. What's more, in this paper, they emphasize that not allowing collections can be even more detrimental as you cannot accurately survey and get diversity information. The data I've collected shows that I utilize responsible collecting practices. To further illustrate that collecting has no impact on populations, here is some data I have. Every point on the bars is a different year of surveying. This first figure on the left shows observations of adults and larvae per month over the three years of data collected. There is a very clear pattern of adults emerging in June and July, larvae being prolific in July and August. This pattern remained throughout all years of this survey, and there were no discernible differences between the years, thus showing that my collections were not impacting the population. When you examine the data closer, you can see that there are even distinct patterns of adults and larvae of each species. The figure on the right highlights Paeonias excicata, the blinded sphinx. Here you can see the pattern of adult activity to larval activity much more clearly. Again, each point being one year of data. This again held true for every year of data collected, once again showing no decline in abundance or frequency of larval encounters. My study site in the Blue Hills is right on the summit of Great Blue Hill. We have three locations we set up on, by the chairlift at the summit, by the observation tower, and one further down the slope at the summit. These areas are all picked because they are wide open spaces surrounded by forest, which is ideal for sphingidae surveying. These organisms fly through open areas looking for mates and nectar. At dusk, when the milkweed is blooming atop Great Blue Hill, 
look around and you may see some Sphingidae visiting flowers. Here are images of light traps from Great Blue Hill. These images represent two of the three types of light used. The first image with the greenish hue is a mercury vapor light. The right image with the whiter hue is a metal halide light. To date, there hasn't been a difference in effectiveness between the lights. We tend to get more individuals at the metal halide setup as it's brightest, but diversity has been the same. The lights exist to complement one another. In the three years of surveying, 10 species have been recorded in the, in the Blue Hills. The diversity index of the site is 1.79. On its own, this number doesn't mean a lot. In order to translate this number into a more meaningful number, we use the effective number of species calculation. This gives us an ENS value of six, which means that at this site, six equally common species are found. I thought I'd end my talk by showing you some of the highlights we found atop Great Blue Hill. Here are just a few images, but I'll go into more details on a few species momentarily. The adult images from left to right, starting at the top, are Paeonias myops, the small-eyed sphinx, Durapsa versicolor, the hydrangea sphinx, Lepara bombacoides, the northern pine sphinx. Underneath, we have Ceratomia undulosa, the waved sphinx, and Paeonias exgicata, the blinded sphinx. On the right, we have three images of larvae from Great Blue Hill. The first is Amorpha juglandis, the walnut sphinx. This is a very common species on all of the walnut trees uh, on most of the uh, Great Blue Hill. Um, if you find a walnut tree in July, you're likely to see this larva on it. Next, we have Lepara bombacoides, the northern pine sphinx. This is again very common on Great Blue Hill on the pines, specifically white and pitch. And lastly, we have Hemeris thysbe. Uh, this is um, a day flying moth known as the uh, hummingbird clearwing. And so as a result, we do not ever see the adults at our lights. However, the larvae are quite common on viburnum species. I wanted to go through and highlight a couple of species that we found on Great Blue Hill. Um, so first we have Dolba hyloeus, the pawpaw sphinx. This is the adult and final instar caterpillar. To the right are its host plants. This species feeds on ilex, which is holly, and on Asimina triloba, or pawpaw. The most common host plants in Massachusetts are ilex glabra, inkberry, and ilex verticillata, winterberry. This species is active as an adult from June through July, and larvae are found from late July into September. On Great Blue Hill, the ilex glabra bushes right by the, uh, the weather's tower, rather, um, are often filled with this larvae in July and August. Next, we have Specodina abidi or abbot sphinx. This is a very early flying sphingidae with adults on the wing from mid-May to mid-June with some stragglers into July. This means their larvae, which are super cool and have two color morphs pictured here, are active in July and early August. The common host plants across its range are plants in the Vitaceae or grape family. Next, we have Ceratomia undulosa or the waved sphinx. This is a fairly large species of sphingidae that is on the wing from May to August and has two broods at least in Massachusetts. The larvae are delightfully variable in color from green to blue to pink, and they feed on Fraxinus or ash species and related plants in the Oleaceae or olive family, including lilac and privet, though the survival of this, uh, this species on those two plants might be limited. Lastly, we will highlight one of my favorite species, Durapsa versicolor or the hydrangea sphinx. This is a striking moth that is extremely localized. You won't often encounter this species, but in the right habitat, they're abundant. On Great Blue Hill, I've only recorded this species once. It is highly unusual because this is a species of wetlands. Its host plants, Cephalanthus occidentalis, which is buttonbush, Decadon verticillatus, swamp loosestrife, and Hydrangea arborescens, smoothleaf hydrangea, are all found in wet areas. I cannot seem to locate the host plants atop Great Blue Hill, which means it likely flew in from somewhere else in the Blue Hills. This moth is on the wing in July and larvae are found in August and September. 
want to learn a little, a uh, lot more about Sphingidae, I think they're a fascinating group of organisms and very worthy of study. I hope this presentation has inspired you to think similarly. And in the last few minutes, I wanted to give you a quick tour of my website where you can learn a lot more information on Sphingidae. And it has things like keys to identification, life history notes, host plant indexes, and more. So I'm just going to quickly go to this link. Uh, when you first log to the website, you will have this beautiful welcome page here. Um, I recommend starting off in the general information tab. Uh, this tab has a number of sections, including how to tell if what the, you're looking at is indeed a sphingid. It also has the entire life history, anatomy, a glossary of common terms, and my most frequently requested section, general rearing notes. Um, the general rearing notes section is essentially just a general guide on how to rear sphingidae. Uh, you can learn sort of the basics here. Um, and if you're curious about more in-depth information on a specific species, you can go to the very top here and navigate to the sphingidae index. This is the entirety of every sphingid found in the US. Well, most of them at this point, it's about 60% completed. Um, but here you can find a visual match for your moth. Click on the moth. Let's go to this one. And it will bring you to a species page. On this page, it will have the adult, the final instar larva, a description, any sort of ecology, life history, rearing notes that are available, um, an entire database of host plants, range maps, and if you scroll down further, ample images of adults and larvae. There are two other features of this site that I think are pretty excellent. First is the host plant index. Um, this index allows you to search either by moth or by plant. If you search by moth, you can type in a genus or a species, and it will pull up all of the records of what that moth eats or the larvae of that moth eats. Alternatively, if you have a plant, you can search for that over here. And this database will give you a list of all of the moths known to feed on that plant as larvae. Lastly, if you are a fan of caterpillars like I am, there's the final instar larval key. So this key is a visual uh, key that will allow you to identify final instar larvae of sphingidae based on region. Currently only the Eastern region is available and you can download the key on this web page. The key is clickable and has couplets that lead you through identification. Um, I think it's a pretty easy to use guide. You do not have to be a scientist to use it. Um, yeah, I think it's a pretty excellent resource. So I hope this presentation inspired you to think about these organisms. And like I said, if you wanna learn more, this is a good website to do it. All right, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so if you have any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat if you'd like me to read them or if you wanna ask them yourself, um, please use the raise hand feature, which you could see if you click on the reactions uh, at the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, and it seems like we're already having some questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna read some of those. So first question is, are any of these species considered invasive? Um, I do not believe there are any invasive sphingidae in the US at this time. Awesome. And next question, which is, um, I'm also quite interested in what type of UV flashlight do you use um, when you're looking for the fluorescent larvae? That is a great question. Um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them available on the market right now. Um, and uh, the UV beast was sort of the original. If you type that into Google or Amazon, you'll get a bunch of different uh, alternatives and most of them work very well. Awesome, thank you. Um, 
Next question, what fraction of reared larvae end up with parasitoids? I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, that is a great question. It really depends on the year. Um, it can be anywhere from, you know, 15 to 20% of larvae collected result in parasitized larvae or upwards of 60 to 80%. Awesome. Um, okay. Next question is, um, seems like this presentation is telling gardeners they should not kill any moth larvae. How can we tell if they're moth larvae? Yes, so um, generally I uh, advise against just uh, killing things in your garden um, without knowing what they are. Uh, if you know it's a pest or something, it's very easy to figure that out and treat it accordingly. There's plenty of great resources for that. Um, as for caterpillars, um, there are plenty of great resources to identify them out there. I personally run a Facebook group called Caterpillar Identification of North America. Um, it has many, many members. I think it's over 15,000 at this point. Um, and that is a great resource for getting things identified. As for um, how to tell if they are moth larvae, well, technically if you find any caterpillar, it is of a moth. Um, butterflies are specialized moths. Um, so they can all be lumped together. But yeah, all caterpillars will turn into either a butterfly or a moth. Amazing, okay, thank you for that. Um, that's super helpful. I feel like all of us <laughs> definitely uh, could spend some more time trying to identify. Um, and our final question, are the horns to fool predators or are they for another reason on the larvae? Yes, uh, so the, the horn is likely a combination of camouflage as well as um, to make themselves look scarier to predators, yes. Um, when you see these larvae resting on branches, the horn sort of blends in really well to like the petiole of a leaf. And so it kind of looks like it's just part of a leaf. Um, but yeah, when they're on their own, the horn is definitely used to fool predators into thinking it's something else. Awesome. That's very cool. Um, we're having some more questions roll in as we speak. Um, has air pollution impacted the moths or their colors? Um, not in Sphingidae. Uh, in other families of moths, there's a very uh, famous example of Biston betularia, the peppered moth, um, which did undergo change due to air pollution in uh, the UK during uh, the Industrial Revolution, but no Sphingidae has undergone that. Awesome. Okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, have you been able to tell a difference in abundance in areas with varied levels of invasive plants? Um, this is a complicated question since it will be based on habitat, but just curious. Um, I don't have a great answer for this, unfortunately. Um, it's something I've been very interested in doing. And so I might start to do some, uh, you know, observational vegetative surveys just to sort of see what the percentage of native plants versus invasive plants in a given area is and what the composition of those habitats are. But at this moment, I do not have an answer for that. That is totally okay, no worries. Um, we've already received some answers to some very interesting questions. Um, thank you again so much uh, for a great presentation. Um, thank you for sharing your research, your insights, knowledge. Um, and as a reminder to everyone who joined us today, um, we hope to see your amazing photos when you enter them in the Blue Hills Photo Contest. Um, and that just about wraps it up. Thank you again, Taya. Thank you very much.